So you might have noticed it's been a while since you've seen me up here, and uh, that's actually not an accident. You see, we're in a series right now called Full Color Christmas, where we're looking at all of the different emotions that go along with a full Christmas experience. Uh, and you might not know this, but our church staff believes that I am secretly a robot. And it's true, I have no human emotions. And so they asked me to just sit this one out. They said, Doug, will you just let the humans handle this one? And uh, we'll get you back in in the new year uh, when we're ready for uh, some stuff. And I, I was okay with it, uh, but I did notice that like Dion and AJ, they're just, just killing themselves. They're working so hard. I said, guys, you gotta, I gotta at least just be able to spell them a little bit. Uh, so how about this? Let's, let's do the Christmas carol sing service weekend. And then we'll get all the emotions from the beautiful Christmas songs. And then people won't even notice that a robot's giving the message. And, and they said, fine. So that's why they slotted me in uh, here. This is the, the one week I get to do, but, but don't worry. I spent this entire week researching human emotions. So I think I'll be able to share something helpful uh, with you anyway. Uh, and, and so to start with, I looked at this pretty uh, interesting thing someone did. They counted all of the words in Christmas songs, the most popular Christmas songs, they counted the most common words. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you the runners up. These are the second through fourth most common words in the songs that we hear and sing at Christmas. And I don't know about you, but these, these kind of these pass the, the sniff test for me. You know, uh, we sing a lot at Christmas about things that we want, what we want for Christmas. And it's apparently two front teeth and a hippopotamus uh, for some reason. Uh, uh, or as the queen of Christmas herself, Mariah Carey, reminds us about twice an hour these days, all she wants for Christmas is you. And then she follows it up with saying the word baby about six times, which brings us to the fourth one. I hadn't thought of it till I saw the list, but we really do say baby a lot in Christmas songs. It, you know, Santa baby, it's, uh, that, that comes up a lot. Uh, the third one it felt like a bit of an outlier to me. I was kind of surprised to see the word no uh, be that common in Christmas songs. But I, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to that one song where the guy keeps asking Mary over and over and over again, did she know did, she, did you know this? Yeah, did you know that? And, and you'd finally just go, she knew, all right. She, the, the angel told her. You didn't have to ask her like 20 times in the same song. So I think, I think that one song probably threw off the, threw off the count there. Uh, but now that we've talked through the second through fourth, I want to give you a chance. So what do you think? What do you think is the most common word in our most popular Christmas songs? Anyone want to take a shout? Jesus, no, sure should be. Light, good guess. Oh, Night, snow, all good guesses, no. Christmas uh, is said a lot, but you kind of can't count that because it is a Christmas song. But, but you're right, Christmas is said very, very often. Uh, so Santa is like 10th. I'm, I was shocked at how low Santa is. So again, all great guesses. All the things you say are, are definitely in the list. Here, all right, here it is. The number one most common word is a little unexpected to me. Mary. Yeah, I, when you hear it, you're like, all right. It makes sense uh, that that's the, that's the thing you hear most commonly. And, and I think there's something true to this idea that if there's a feeling that we're supposed to associate with Christmas, it's this feeling of merry, jolly, cheer, joy. Th these are the, the words that, that it's like, that's what we sing about at Christmas. That's the expectation that we're supposed to have. And yet they've done a study, and for a significant chunk of us, when we hear these Christmas songs, Mary is not the emotion that it brings out in us. Uh, in fact, a, a lot of us, when we hear these Christmas songs, we have a, a negative reaction. It's, in, in fact, it makes us feel crankier, grouchier, uh, you know, less merry when we hear these songs. Uh, and in fact, for, for a lot of us, when we hear these songs, it makes us feel a lot of the same feelings that we've been talking about in this series. Uh, if, you, if you haven't been here for the last few weeks, uh, we've worked through these, these three feelings. And what we've said is these are a part of the Christmas experience and, and we, we wish they weren't. We, we wish we could just not be sad, not be angry, not be fearful at Christmas. And yet... If you look at the original Christmas story, if you, you look at the nativity, all of these emotions, uh, negative as they might be, are, are integral to the story. Uh, you don't have the Christmas story with, without the, the sadness of a hope deferred with Elizabeth and Zechariah. You don't have the Christmas story without the anger of betrayal or, or the fear that comes with an unexpected pregnancy. These feelings are all a part of the story, whether we, we wish they were there or not. And, and so we have to include them as, as something that we feel. 
Uh, and today we get to the fourth one. And so what we're going to talk about today is this fourth feeling that we need for a full color Christmas, and it's joy. And, and you might think, wait a minute, one of these things is not like the other. These are all the things that we wish weren't a part of Christmas and, and yet are. You know, joy is, is by definition the feeling of Christmas. Why? Why is this on the list? And, and I'll tell you, it's on the list because there is something that all four of these share that you might not know. Uh, and it's not that they are all the main characters in the Pixar movie Inside Out. That's, that's not uh, what they have in common. And if it were for that, we'd have to have a whole week on disgust. And there's just only so much I can say about fruitcake and... So, so it's not that. Uh, it, it's that these are considered by uh, counselors, psychologists, uh, therapists, these are considered primary emotions, uh, that these are kind of the core feelings. There's a, lot, there's a whole lot of emotion words out there. The rest of them are, kind of, are called secondary. They're more complex. These are core primary emotions. And we would, in general, classify these first three as negative, and, and this last one is a, is a positive core emotion. Uh, and yet, here's my, the premise, and, and here's what I want us to, to wrestle with today. I believe that, that many of us, many of us resist the feeling of joy at Christmas just as much if not more so than we resist sadness, anger, and fear. That's my premise. That, that's what I, I think is going on. And, and I'll tell you that I, I came to that because I, I've noticed how joy plays out in my own life. Uh, some of you might know that I am a, an Air Force kid, uh, and specifically both of my parents were Air Force officers. It's one thing to have one parent who's in the military, but when you have two of them, our family was run with military precision and efficiency. Uh, and if you, you know anything about that, emotions just get in the way uh, of that kind of efficiency. When, when a drill sergeant tells someone to drop and give him 20 push-ups, he doesn't give a rip how the person feels about doing that. It, that's irrelevant. You have to, I gave you a command and order. You have to, to do it. Uh, and, and so feelings were seen uh, in, my, in my upbringing, my family of origin, as, uh, as a distraction or an obstacle to the, the good life, to, to living a life of, of harmony uh, and a family that worked well. And, and on the one hand, that makes sense for the negative emotions. It made sense growing up that, that my parents didn't like it when I was angry or fearful or, or sad. But what was, what was really surprising was that even though they, they, they clamped down on, on those feelings as well, when, if I was joyful or excited, for some reason, that, was like, that caused an even more extreme offended reaction on the part of people around me. That I learned growing up that, that joy was a thing that got me in trouble. That I'd be so excited for Christmas to come and I couldn't wait to, to talk about it. And, and that just bothered my parents so much that I couldn't wait. Just wait, just wait. Why do you have to keep bothering us about joy uh, and, and your excitement for Christmas? And, and it wasn't just a family thing. I, my, my parents were awesome. They, they, they loved me. But this is a thing that was echoed in the world around me. Uh, I grew up playing team sports. I, I still love to play team sports. And, and there was just in my personality, I innately really love to encourage uh, the people on my team. And so when we'd be playing games, I'd be like, oh, that was a great shot. Way to go, score that touchdown. Uh, you know, nice defense there. I, I, just, I just naturally love to encourage uh, the other guys on my team. Uh, and, and interestingly, the reaction to them was not, Doug's a great leader. Doug should be the captain. Doug helps us play better. The reaction was, Shut up, Doug. Like, why do you have to talk about it? Like, just play the game. Like, stop being so uh, excited. It was, it, it was like it bothered them that I was excited for them, excited for our team to do well. My, 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 my joyous, uh, you know, exuberance landed badly on them. Or, or a little later when I was older and I knew I wanted to marry my wife and I was so excited to propose to her and I put a ton of effort into the proposal. I made a, I actually made a video, I had a professional video editor work with me on it. Uh, I, I wanted it to be a huge celebration with all of our friends and family. Her best friend uh, lived out of state. So I actually called up her best friend months ahead of time and I said, hey, I will pay for your plane ticket. Let me fly you in for the proposal party. And, and the friend said no. And she didn't, say this exactly, but I think the implication I picked up loud and clear was on, on her friend's part was, let's wait and see if she says yes first. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not willing to commit to a plane ticket. I'll, I'll be out there for the wedding. If there's a wedding, I'll come. But I experienced it from a variety of places that, that this moment of me being excited about proposing to someone, ha having uh, my life partner, it, it wasn't matched. It, people were more likely to, to clamp down 
to, to reject, to judge, than to share in my excitement and my joy. And as I've looked around, I, I see that go on all around us to this day. I, I think that there is something distinct about joy that makes it uniquely threatening to the people around us when, when we feel it. It makes it threatening to us when we perceive it in others. You see, I, I've, I've come to the conclusion, I think, that, that for a lot of us, the light of other people's joy, even though that's wonderful for them, it inevitably ends up casting a shadow on our own broken hearts. That if there's something in your life that you're not joyful about, if there's something in your life that's wrong, that, that's hurtful, that's less than what you'd hoped for, then when other people are joyful, it, it just casts into relief where your life is, is hurting and broken. It, which means it helps me understand a little bit why I think joy causes such extreme negative reactions in others, because there's not a one of us who's living a perfect life. There's not a one of us that doesn't have some aspect of our life that, that's hurtful, that, that's not what we wish it was, or a relationship that, that's broken, a, a dream that hasn't come true. And so then when we see that joy, instead of being able to share in it, it, it then instead provokes all sorts of negative reactions in us, uh, anger, fear, sadness. And in fact, the very same emotions we've been talking about for the last three weeks, uh, the reason I think it's so important for Christians above all others to be able to engage with the feelings of Christmas is because if we don't engage with those feelings in a holy, biblical, scriptural way, then what ends up happening is those feelings mean that even joy itself becomes unattainable. What I've experienced is even as someone who was raised and had my own joy squelched because of other people's reactions to it, I'm no better. I do the same exact thing. Uh, when other people have joy around me, my, my, my knee-jerk tendency is if, it, is if it pokes some sort of a, of a brokenness in me, it is to lash out out of my own anger, fear, or sadness. Uh, in fact, just last week, my, my son came to me and he was super excited because uh, he plays basketball and, and the coach on the basketball team had said that he was gonna be the point guard this season. And if you don't know, the point guard, that, that's like the play manager. Like you're, you're the, the most critical role because you start all of the plays when you're the point guard. And, and do you think when my son came to me in joy with this exciting news, dad, I'm gonna be the point guard, do you think that I responded with equivalent joy? You think I said, great job, son. I'm so proud of you. You must be so glad that this happens. You think that's what I said? No, it's not what I said. I said, oh man, then you'd better start practicing your dribbling more. I, I met his joy with, with, with criticism and, and, and judgment. And, and what I think is going on as I reflected on it is it's because that news, it provoked fear in me. That, that I've watched him play and, and I know how, how pivotal that point guard position is and, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid that he's gonna, they're gonna lose games and it's gonna be because he makes a mistake or he, he turns the ball over and then his teammates are gonna be mad at him and, and he's gonna be disappointed and ashamed and, and I'm afraid of all of these things that might happen to him and so I wanna, I clamp down because I, I wanna protect him, protect him from the thing that I'm fearful of. Or, or I think about, uh, you know, and it's not just fear. I, I think anger and sadness play in too. Uh, we have a, a tradition when I pick up all three kids from school, uh, we play rotating DJ uh, on the drive home, uh, which just like I let the kids have my phone and they just, they each get to take turns picking what song we listen to. Uh, and me and, and the two littlest, uh, we, we tend to just pick favorites, you know, songs that we all know uh, and love. But my oldest, she's 14, and 14 is an awesome uh, season because you're just hearing all the great new music when you're 14. Uh, and so my 14-year-old, she doesn't pick the same old hits. She's always introducing us to these really new songs, these songs that she's just heard that she's delighted in. Uh, and do you think that the reaction of her siblings when she plays a new song that we haven't heard before, do you think they say, thank you, dear sister, for broadening our musical horizons, for sharing your joy with us in this new song? Or do they say, this song sucks, when's it my turn? And again, I, I see in that, I think there's maybe some anger, so some resentment, that there's something that's going on that says, ah, it should have been my turn. I would have picked a better song. 
And, and I'm, I'm actually encouraged, believe it or not, because I don't think this is a new phenomenon. I don't think we suddenly got cynical and jaded and started cracking down on other people's joy. This goes all the way back to Bible times. So one of the, the early stories of, of Christian faith is from 3,000 years ago, uh, when King David, who is God's chosen leader, had the opportunity to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the capital city. And he was so excited. This was a huge deal that this would solidify God's power, his own authority. Like this is as big of a deal as it could get. And here's how the story goes in 2 Samuel. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. He felt joy. He, he, he modeled and, and, and lived out the joy of this amazing, awesome thing that gets to happen. And so wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. That's how joyful he was. Uh, But as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, that's David's wife, she was watching from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And when David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. And she said, oh, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. We would need to have a whole week on sarcasm just to, just to cover this story. But, but look at that, that, that even all those years ago, she, she saw someone joyful and joyful appropriately about a thing he should be joyful about. And, and, in, and what did it provoke in her? She despised him in her heart. And, and I think that that matches probably a lot of our own life experiences. It certainly matches mine. That whether you yourself are naturally joyful or not, whether you're more prone to to some of the negative feelings, when we do have joy, it it seems to provoke despising. It seems to provoke anger and fear and sadness. And and not just people like, uh, you know, leaders uh, in the kingdom of God. I I see it just amongst church culture in general, that that there's this this fear that, that if we were ever to actually be joyful, God himself would punish us for it. That God is the ultimate joy killer, that that he's waiting for for us to get too excited about something so that he can then cruelly and ironically teach us a lesson. I'll teach you to get excited about this. You should just be focused on the things God wants to be focused on, which is righteousness and and sternness and and living holy lives with no fun at all. That's certainly a message that I internalized growing up. I I don't think any any preacher ever said you shouldn't have joy uh, as a Christian. In fact, I, I think they said the opposite. They said you should. And yet what was lived out was don't get too excited. Don't, don't, don't get too into the singing. Don't clap during church. And this is a great church here at Pathfinder. We clap during church and I love it because that, that's a joyful expression. But, but for so many of us, what we heard, what we learned, what was, what we, was the air we breathed was that joy is untrustful. Joy is a thing that you, you shouldn't give into because one way or another, the other shoe is gonna drop. Someone's gonna crack, clamp down on it. God himself is gonna ruin your joy. And yet, let me proudly and defiantly tell you that that is not God's character. That is not how the Bible itself describes God. That may be how, how religious people feel about that feeling of joy, but God himself is not the joy killer. He's the joy bringer. He's the one who wants us to have joy. And, and that is nowhere more obvious and more clear than in the Christmas story itself. So let's look again at Luke chapter two. We've been working through the story little by little over the last few weeks, but today, today we get to the climax. Today, we get to the point of all of this. You see, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Like there it is, why? Why all this mess and nonsense with wise men and, and, and donkeys and, and going you know, cross road when you're nine months pregnant? Like why all of this stuff? It's for joy. That this is the point of all of it. It's a common thing to say in here these days that, that Jesus is the reason for the season and, and that that's mostly right, but, but it's, it's stopping a step too short. That the reason for Jesus is joy. 
That, that Jesus didn't come for his own sake. He's not actually the end goal of, of, this, of this Christmas season. It's that in the coming of Jesus, God wanted you and I to have joy. Joy is the reason for the season. And Jesus just happens to be the method. That's how God did it. It's because the angel went on to say, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was sure enough lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all of these things. She pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And this is our Christmas story for today. And what I I love as we read this together is that I see some, some really powerful and important truths about joy that I think maybe we miss here in our own modern day context. So some things that that we observe in the Christmas story, and I want to just point out a few of them to you today. And so the first is this, that joy is incited by God's actions, not by ours. I think there's this idea that we have to be the creators of joy in our own life. We have to live a life that's that's perfect enough, holy enough, uh, successful enough, meaningful enough, that that we then, by our good actions, create lives of joy. And that is not the picture in the Bible. It's not the picture at Christmas. The, The shepherds did not do anything to deserve this good moment of joy. They didn't make it happen. They weren't more pious than anybody else. They they didn't make sure that a baby was born in a manger. God did that. God brought Jesus, a baby in a manger, to be the savior of all the earth. God was the instigator, the catalyst of joy in their lives, not us. And, and, And I hope that's encouraging to you. It is to me. Because it takes the burden off of us. I think we otherwise think that if, that if our lives are not joyful, if we don't feel this feeling, or if we don't clamp down on it, or it's because we did something wrong or that we, we have to do something right to earn it. And we don't. Joy is actually a gift of God. It was a gift to the shepherds. Jesus is a gift to all mankind. And the nice thing about a gift is you don't earn it, you don't deserve it, you don't make it happen. Someone else does it for you. And this is the first thing we learn about joy from this story. Joy is something God does for us, not something we build for ourselves. And, and then not only that, this might, it might be a little uh, unexpected, but also as I look at the story, joy is actually disruptive to the ordinary course of our lives. Like we, we think that joy is actually part of the plan, part of our schedule, a part of our intentions for our lives. It's actually not that we have plans and schedules and intentions for our lives and we would live them out and and we would just walk them and they would be boring and ordinary if joy didn't interrupt, if joy didn't come into the middle of what we thought we were gonna be doing today and tomorrow and next year and say, actually, this amazing thing is gonna happen instead. It's it's going to interrupt your well-laid plans. And, And that's the picture in the Christmas story. The shepherds had no idea that this night was any different from any other night. They weren't planning on having a good night's sleep interrupted. They weren't planning on a sudden road trip to Bethlehem. I don't know what they were planning, but I'm certain it wasn't that. And God's joy interrupted whatever course their lives had been on. Joy is something God gives us as a gift and and he intends it to disrupt our ordinary, our mundane, the things that we would settle for Joy is bigger than what we would ever plan for ourselves, and God gives it to us. Which then brings us to our third point about joy, that I believe joy is intended, that the true joy, that the, the disruptive joy that God gives, it provokes an outsized response from us. And I think this is true for everyone, that, that no matter what, when joy disrupts your life, you will have an overreactive uh, response to it. It will be either overreactive positively or negatively. 
And we see in this story a, a positive overreaction from the shepherds. They, they immediately disrupted their lives. They immediately said, we're going to go to Bethlehem. We're going to see this thing. And then when they saw the thing, they weren't done. They then immediately spread the news everywhere. It doesn't say whether they waited for people to wake up or whether they were knocking on their doors at like three in the morning. But one way or another, they made sure the whole town knew that the shepherd's response was huge. It was disproportionate. It's beyond just the ordinary thing that we would do. And, and I think this is a little bit why of the secret, why when we have joy or when we see it in others, why, why we also, I think, have a disproportionately negative response because joy is that big, it's that powerful that one way or another, we're, we're gonna have a big reaction to it. And, and, I, and I want to learn from the shepherds to have an outsized positive response, not just that, that knee-jerk, triggered, negative, clamping down response. That, that's, that's what I see in the story. That's what I, I hope for us. But I, I, I want to pause here and, and, and maybe correct an assumption because I think part of all of these three things, part of this biblical teaching on joy is that joy is, I believe, a feeling. And, and a feeling is not actually something that we can choose for ourselves. A, a, a feeling is a natural uh, reaction to external stimuli around us in the world. Uh, but what we can do is we can choose our, our response to the feeling. But I don't think we can choose the feeling. And, and that's important uh, because I think there's a message that sometimes gets out there. Uh, it's one that uh, we have a local Christian radio station. Some of you probably like it and listen to it. I, I love it too. And, and they have a, a slogan. It's on all of their, their merchandise, everything you can buy. And then the slogan is, choose joy. And if, if you love that, and if that works for you, and that's just a little, little bit of a reminder for you to have joy in your life, then wonderful. I'm, I'm glad that it works for you that way. Uh, I'll say this, for me, this has always landed wrong. It's always landed a, a bit uh, luxury, and like it's blaming me for not having enough joy in my life. It's saying, choose joy, gosh darn it. Uh, and, and if you don't have joy, it's your fault because you didn't choose it. You should have, you should have chosen the joy. And, and and that's why I think it's so important to, to be really clear because I, I do not believe we can choose feelings. I believe we can only choose our, our responses to those feelings. So this would be the equivalent of if I had told my wife that, that I was gonna you know, do the dishes you know, while she was gone before she got home and then she came home and, and, and the dishes were not done and she was really mad at me. I think the way to solve it would not be for me to say, hang on, I, I think I know what we need to do here. I think in this moment, you need to choose to love me. I think that's what you gotta do. I think she would rightly say, no, no, in this moment, I'm angry. I'm choosing not to throw something at you and you should be grateful. And I am. So, but I think that, when, that this, when, we, when we say we can choose emotions, I, I think it leads to some unhelpful and some, I think some shaming messages because I think we have to differentiate that, that feelings are a morally neutral reaction to external stimulus. It's our behaviors, the responses that we choose to make, that's the only thing we have power over. And by the way, that's my opinion. I, I do think it is, it is supported by the Bible. Uh, the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter four, uh, God says in, in, a, in this letter to us, in your anger, do not sin. And it's a very short little sentence that's deceptively uh, important. Because what, notice what he's saying. He's not saying that the anger itself is a sin. He's not saying, choose not to get angry. That the Bible teaches, no, actually, you're going to get angry. That's going to that's gonna happen. When you get angry, in your response, choose a response that's not sinning. And I think that's so powerful and important, not just for anger, but for all of the emotions. Because I think what ends up happening otherwise is that, that we think that the holy thing to do, the Christian thing to do, is to squelch all the bad feelings and the good ones. And squelching them is not what we're called to do. And in fact, it'd be, it'd be harmful if we did. If something sad happens in your life, if you lose someone or something important to you, it would be, it would be gross not to feel sad about that. You should. If you love someone or if something's not right, you should feel sad about it. If something unjust happens around you, you should feel angry. Uh, that's, that's appropriate. If something scary or fearful happens, guess what? It's really important for your life that you feel fear uh, when, when you should. If, if a tiger suddenly bounded onto this stage and you didn't scatter in fear, I'd say there was something wrong with you. 
because that was a fearful thing that happened. You, you should feel fear about it. But what we can do, what we should do as Christians is embrace those feelings and, and then through our own spiritual growth, through our own walk with Jesus, change the way we react to the feelings. Don't hide the anger, the sadness, the fear. Embrace it and then see what holy response it's calling us to. Uh, and since not everyone was here the last few weeks, I, I wanna just show you that this is what we've talked about, that, that in, in these feelings, that they call us to a holy response, every one of them, that, that when we experience sadness, it, it's inviting us to, to notice that loss and that pain uh, and to use it to prioritize the things that matter, to, to focus on our loves, that, that, that sadness is in direct proportion to how, how deeply we love something or someone in our lives. That, that anger is an invitation for us to, to choose to, to do an action that makes things right, to become agents of justice, whether it's just uh, in a moment of, of fracture between family members or, or whether it's something going on at, at your workplace or in the world, we're, we're called to, to let our anger drive us to holy justice for others. Or fear, if you were here last week, is this invitation to, to, to not pretend you're not fearful to not hide that you're afraid, but to let it drive you to the throne of our God and say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified right now and I, I, I'm choosing to trust you in my terror. See, every one of these feelings, the feelings are morally neutral, but we can have a holy response. And when we do, that's what makes Christmas the fullness of what God intended it to be. And so that brings us now to our final one, what we're talking about today, that I do believe that joy is a disruptive feeling, that, that it's intended to, to break us out of our ruts, out of the patterns, the, the plans that, that we would settle for, that, that joy is this, this outside uh, invasion of God into our ordinary lives, and that then it invites us to express gratitude to our Heavenly Father for this joyful interruption that he brought to us. And, and this is a, is a powerful and important truth. Because like we saw in the story, those shepherds, they, they didn't choose this interruption of their lives. They, they didn't make a baby be born in a, in a manger. But what happened was they chose a response to this interruption of joy that we're still talking about 2,000 years later. See, I don't think this, the shepherds were any more special or any less special than anyone else. I think there was one key thing that set the shepherds apart, why they got to be the messengers of joy. I think they were the group of people that was more open to having their lives interrupted. Like, I think about all the other people in Jerusalem and Bethlehem and all, and all of that area. If they'd gotten this good news of great tidings, if God had interrupted them at two in the morning, how many of them would have just turned right back over and gone back to sleep? I'll, I'll tell you, that's what I would have done. <laughs> I've been a parent for the last 14 years. Sleep is desperate. Uh, and if anything interrupts my sleep, all I wanna do is get through it so I can go back to bed. I think I wouldn't have made time for this joyful interruption on the first Christmas. I would have said, you know, thanks God, appreciate it. Talk to me again at eight in the morning and then we'll, we'll discuss it more. I, and I think that's the choice that you and I have to make. We truly cannot choose joy. We cannot choose what God's disrupting, but we can choose to slow down, to create a life of gratitude that, that says when those joyful interruptions happen, we're actually willing to let them interrupt our lives. Because here's my belief, and let me say this so clearly and strongly to you all now today. That first Christmas 2,000 years ago, that is not the only time God has disrupted our lives in the name of joy. God has continued to do it every day ever since in every one of our lives. Your life and mine, there are joy disruptions of God happening all day long, every day in our lives, I promise you. But what I also believe is this, we don't see them. We're not open to them. I'm too busy to have any sort of joy interruption. I've got, I've got places to get the kids. I've got practices to go to. I've got deadlines to meet. And, and so it's like God is bombarding us with joy all the time. And we just don't even know it because we've just got the, the focus on, we're in the tunnel. We're just trying to get through the day. We cannot choose joy, but we can choose gratitude. 
And that's something that I've been working on for the last several years just to share with you today as, as we close, that, that you might have remembered from years ago, I, I used to talk about that I did not know how to experience joy anymore. That, that I, I, I'd had it beaten out of me so much in my upbringing that joy was threatening, joy was scary. I'd clamped down on all of the feelings. So much so that, that when people would ask me, good-hearted people who loved me, who cared about me, they, they'd say, what would bring you joy? And, and my answer was, I, I can't even answer that question. I, I don't even know how to engage with it at any level. And, and so the change I made, I made about six years ago, and I made it under duress and coercion because important people in my life said, you're miserable and you're making us miserable. So please do something about it. And so the thing I did on, on advice and reflection was I started gratitude journaling. Three times, every day, three things that I'm grateful for from that day. And I'll tell you, I, I did it, I, I grumbled, and, and I did it, and, and, and I'll let you know that after, after gratitude journaling uh, for, for several months, nothing was different in my life at all. I did not suddenly become Mary Poppins skipping down the street whistling songs. I, I did not become a joyful, exuberant person. But what happened was, I did change what I started to notice about my day that the end of my day was always complaints and the stresses and the things that had gone wrong. And, and early on, it was really hard for me to say, what were three things that went well, three things that I'm grateful for? And, and after six months, I, I didn't suddenly, I wasn't a different person. I didn't, didn't have a different personality, but I was more joyful. I, I, I wasn't landing on, on people around me in, in the same negative way that I used to. And, and now here I am, it, it is six years later. And the people who are closest to me have seen the difference, that, that, that I'm a different person, that, that joy actually is more natural in my life. And, and, and it wasn't magic. It, it, it wasn't that God did anything new in my life. The joy was always there. It was that I just never poised myself to notice it. And in fact, I had, I had something happen just, just two days ago. I have to share with you that six years of gratitude journaling, it, it, it's finally opened up more cracks in my life to see what God is doing, these joyful disruptions all the time. I was running very late on this sermon. The sermons are due Friday at noon so the tech team can get them all ready to go. And it was Thursday night and I was nowhere where I needed to be. And so what I do when I'm running behind is Friday morning, I get up really early. I was up uh, and writing at 6 a.m. to try and get this thing done by noon, which could be a stressful, frustrating thing to have to do, to, to lose sleep, to have to get up earlier. Uh, but what happened was, I don't know if any of you were up this Friday at 6 a.m., the most amazing sunrise I've ever seen in my life. It's 50 degrees in December, and the clouds were perfect. The, the sky was pink and orange and, and blue. And even though I was in a hurry and the clock was ticking, there was a deadline, I just stopped my car. And I got out and I just looked. I thought, God didn't have to do that. He didn't have to give me a beautiful sunrise on a random Friday morning. And that sunrise, it was there for everybody. It was only there for me because I was stressed and deadlined and behind. And I was so grateful that I was able to take the time. I took 10 minutes and just appreciated this gift that God had given me. And I still got the sermon turned in. That's the change that's been made in my life. It's not that God's doing more to bless me. It's not that more joyful things are happening. It's that I'm finally seeing them because I chose gratitude. And I hope this Christmas that you'll make that same choice and you'll let God interrupt your life with more of the joy that he is so desperate to give us. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that you're the initiator of all these wonderful things, that you are the one who brings joy into the world, not just through your son 2,000 years ago, but, but here now, every day of our lives, you're lavishing your love and delight on us. And so Lord, here now, I pray that you would help us lay down our own resistance. The, the, the lessons that have been beat into us, that the joy is unsafe, joy is, is too disruptive, joy is too big. Lord, I pray that you'd help us open up some cracks and let your joy come through. 
And so Lord, help us to make choices that slow our lives down, that help us be more open to interruption, choices that help us focus on the things that there are to be grateful for every single day. And Lord, use it to magnify our joy here and now in this Christmas season. We pray this in your holy name, amen.